Hello, Philosophy 102. Um, so this week we are starting relevance fallacies. We're actually starting fallacies and we will continue with fallacies for the next two weeks. Uh, so that's three chapters of fallacies. Uh, I like to teach all the fallacies, but I don't have time to teach all the fallacies. So we are going to be a bit selective as we move through these fallacies. Uh, if you're reading the chapters on your own, I would encourage you to make sure you don't dwell on ones that are not going to be on the midterm. Um, a lot of these fallacies bear striking resemblances to each other or um, are the same fallacy in essence, but manifest a little differently. So. All of the fallacies in this chapter are relevance fallacies. We could just learn about relevance fallacies if you really wanted to, uh, but it's better to break it down because they all operate a little differently. So that's what we're going to be doing. Um, next week we will do inductive fallacies. Um, and those are fundamentally different in nature to these relevance fallacies. Noticing these essential differences is going to be really helpful to keeping our fallacies organized and seeing what's going wrong in them. Uh, the other relevant thing is that after next week, we will begin studying for our midterm exam. So here's the announcement. I told you I would give you guys plenty of warning. So we will complete chapter seven and the homework associated with chapter seven. And then we'll begin studying for our midterm, which will be the following week. Okay, don't stress it too much. I am going to send out an email about the midterm exam and uh, yeah, we'll have plenty of time to talk about it. But this is your first early warning. Uh, this is all the content it's going to cover. It will be one, chapter one through chapter seven. So hopefully that sounds good to you guys. Again, I know it causes panic in students to learn that, oh my goodness, there's a midterm exam. Um, I'm giving you early warning and heads up. If you take a look at our syllabus, you'll notice that this is exactly when it was scheduled to happen. And um, yeah, it's, it's nothing to stress about. Okay, so on to this chapter. I'm not going to dwell too much on what you're supposed to learn to do in this chapter. I just want to um, launch right into what a fallacy is. So time now to talk about fallacies indeed. <laughs> a fallacy is a mistake in reasoning, an argument that doesn't really support or prove the contention it's supposed to support or prove. This is going to be the first thing we're going to put in our notes. It's important to have a clear definition of what a fallacy is, right? Uh, you're not going to be quizzed on the textbook definition of a fallacy, but here it is with its weird font. Okay, so what does this mean? A mistake in reasoning, an argument, you know what the definition of an argument is, that doesn't really support or prove the contention it's supposed to support or prove. This is going to be true of all the fallacies we look at. So it's important to recognize that it is indeed an argument. Everything we've looked at up until now uh, really hasn't been an argument. We've talked a lot about what arguments are and what they are not and the different types of arguments. Uh, so I suppose we could say a fallacious argument is a different type of argument. It's the type of argument you do not want to make. These come in the inductive variety. They come in the deductive variety. They come in the hot mess <laughs> variety. Sometimes it's really hard to figure out what these arguments are really trying to do. Um, but they, uh, they fail to do it. They fail to prove or support the contention, right? the conclusion that they are supposed to support or prove. Relevance fallacies do this uh, because usually the premise is irrelevant to the conclusion. This is very different to uh, the other kinds of fallacies. So the fallacies we talk about this in this chapter all share this feature in common. The information we're given is irrelevant in one way or another to the conclusion 
that the argument is supposed to lead us to. So rather than continuing to define relevance fallacies, let's just take a look at one. You tell me it's dangerous to text when I'm driving, but I have seen you doing it. Right? So this is a pretty clear example of a relevance fallacy. What's going on here? The speaker is dismissing someone's claim that it's dangerous to drive and text. However, the fact that the other person texts while he or she are driving has no bearing on whether texting while driving is dangerous. Right? Why would, why would it matter? You could be calling somebody out on their hypocrisy. Um, you could accept their conclusion, yes, it's dangerous to text while driving, um, and then make an argument of your own from that. Um, right? Therefore, you shouldn't text while driving. But the fact that somebody does a dangerous activity or engages in a dangerous activity in no way proves that that activity is not dangerous. Why would it? Um, so this one, I really like this example because we like to call out hypocrisy, but it's kind of useless in this form, right? We can see that uh, this reasoning is seriously erroneous. So this argument is a fallacy, a mistake in reasoning. It is also an example of a relevance fallacy because its premise, I have seen you doing it, is not relevant to the issue in question, whether texting while driving is dangerous. Cool, huh? Uh, so really briefly, you might have heard relevance fallacies called red herrings. Uh, this is another popular name for them. And again, this is just the name for the entire category of relevance fallacies. Everything we're covering in this chapter is a red herring. So uh, those of you who are familiar with this, you might be tempted to say, oh, well, that's a red herring. Uh, that's not going to be good enough. <laughs> so of course these are all red herrings. Red herrings are just a different way of describing relevance fallacies, and that's what this chapter is about. So we're going to be looking at it a little more in depth. Uh, if you're wondering why it's called a red herring, it's because a herring is a smelly fish that if dragged across the trail a hound is tracking might lead the hound on a wild goose chase, right? It's, it lends, shoots it down this irrelevant path. Um, the fish is merely a distracting irrelevancy. So they're all going to have this feature in one way or another. So let's get started. So uh, there are general categories of fallacies, like red herrings, uh, relevance fallacies, uh, and then there are subcategories, and there are still even further subcategories. So uh, argument ad hominem is a subcategory. It's one step down. You're going to notice in the textbook that these are highlighted in red. And the further subcategories, as we will see, are uh, written in blue, or not blue, green, I'm sorry. Um, I realize that I said highlighted when clearly I've actually highlighted this in yellow, but they're written in red and then the subcategories mean meaning the types of relevance fallacies that are ad homs uh, are highlighted in, or are written in green. I'm so sorry, I don't know why I keep saying that. Okay, so the, this is this big complicated Latin word um, or phrase, argumentum ad hominem. So we're going to put that in our notes. And if you want to try to organize them by category and subcategory, you're welcome to do that, but they'll follow a general pattern that I hope you pick up on. I'm not going to uh, do anything to indicate what is necessarily a subcategory of the other ones. I'll, I say that, but I'll probably make note every time it changes. So we often call this just an ad hom. So I'm going to write that here. If you guys want to call it that, that that's absolutely fine. Uh, what does this big old Latin phrase actually mean? Uh, it means an argument from the man, right? We can see or man in here, and we can see argument in here. So it's really just a, a personal, it's 
really just a personal attack. And this is not to say that all personal attacks are fallacious. Uh, I really glaze over that, and, and I think a lot of philosophers do. Um, speaking to somebody's character or qualifications is perfectly legitimate. But if you're just attacking the person and it is irrelevant to what they've said, then you've committed an ad hom, right? We're looking at, we want information that is relevant to our conclusions, not information that's just rude to the person who said the thing. So we'll talk more about what this looks like. But yeah, this is just a personal attack. So it's pronounced the way it's spelled. <laughs> Uh, this type of argument is the most co common fallacy on planet Earth. They say this. Uh, I, I'm not sure why. I don't know if they ever did any research. Did they poll all people on all their thinking? I don't know how you could come to a conclusion like that. Uh, as always, I encourage you to be uh, skeptical of your textbook's claims when they're this far flung. Uh, anyway, the name tra translates as argument to the person. Right? Uh, you commit this fallacy if you think dismissing someone's proposition, right? the idea, the proposal, the claim, the argument, etc., by dismissing him or her. So let's we can put this in our notes um, because again, it's not just any critique of a person; it's an irrelevant critique of a person. Let's get that in our notes. I don't know why this is continuing to be italicized. Let's get rid of that. Okay. So what does this look like? Well, it looks exactly like the argument we just spoke about. So take the example about texting and driving. Recall what was going on, the issue, whether it is dangerous to text and drive, but instead of discussing the other person's position on the issue, the speaker, the person committing the fallacy, started talking about the other person. The speaker's argument was directed at the person, right, that's an ad hom, uh, not at what the other person said. So let's modify that example slightly. Not only have I seen you text and drive, but just last week you were saying it isn't dangerous to do that. Does that fix it? No, not at all. Um, this too is an ad hom. Instead of addressing whether it is dangerous to text, the speaker, the person committing the fallacy, is still talking about the other person. <laughs> Apparently thinking that the fact that the individual has changed positions on the issue somehow nullifies what he or she has said. Uh, most of you are probably too young to remember this. Well, maybe it's happened in politics since then, but... Uh, we, yeah, we don't need to use a specific example. In politics, you will sometimes hear somebody called a flip-flopper. Uh, and that's, that's really struggling, or, or a struggle to me. It's troubling to me. Uh, because people should be able to change their positions. Um, that's what that entire second extra credit assignment I mentioned was about. We want to change our positions if we've arrived at them erroneously. So we're going to use this as our example of a general ad hom in our notes. Look at that mess. Okay, so that's an example. It just attacks the person saying the thing, not the idea. We've got some more examples in here, but I think it gets a bit boring. Once you see what's going on in these arguments, uh, it's pretty apparent that they're lousy arguments, that they're erroneous in nature. So we'll, we'll look at these really quickly, uh, but then we'll be ready to move on. We don't need to put them in our notes, I don't think. What do I think about the president's proposal for immigration reform? It's ridiculous. He just wants Latino votes. Right? Uh, the speaker is just bad-mouthing the president, which doesn't tell us anything at all about the strengths or weaknesses of the president's proposal. Right? So what if he just wants Latino votes? That doesn't mean the proposal is bad. Right? Maybe he does just want Latino votes. Um, again, doesn't make it a bad proposal. So, if the speaker wants to show the president's proposal is ridiculous, the speaker had better talk about the proposal. So, let's look at this one more example. 
and see what's going on here. You can forget what Father Hennessy said about the dangers of abortion because Father Hennessy is a priest and priests are required to hold such views. The speaker in this example isn't exactly bad-mouthing Father Hennessy, but he or she is sti still isn't talking about what Father Hennessy says. In fact, you'll notice it says you can just go ahead and forget it, <laughs> whatever it was. Um, in instead, he or she is talking about Hennessy's circumstances being a priest. If someone gave you this argument, you wouldn't have the faintest idea what Fa Father Hennessy actually thinks about thinks the dangers of abortions are, let alone what's wrong with his thinking. Right? So, right, we've got a little repeat here. We, it is, in essence, we just need to make sure that we are critiquing what was actually said, uh, the actual issue at hand, um, the actual claim that's been made, not the individual who made the claim. Right? You might have heard the statement, uh, broken clock is right twice a day. Uh, so, you know, it, it's, somebody could be just wrong the vast majority of the time. That doesn't mean we can dismiss their claims based on who they are. Uh, they, we, we look at the issue they have presented or the claim they have made, not as them, at them as individuals. The first subcategory of ad hom, which is a subcategory of a red herring, is poisoning the well. So this is going to be a type, a unique type of personal attack. Uh, let's see what happens when I... Oh, okay, so it does distinguish somehow between uh, the main categories and the subcategories. All right. Excellent. What is poisoning the well? Uh, speakers and writers sometimes try to get us to dismiss what someone is going to say by talking about the person's consistency or character or circumstances. This is known as poisoning the well, right? So uh, this fallacy tries to get us to dismiss what someone is going to say by talking about blah, blah, blah. Um, mostly just by talking about the person. <laughs> In fact, we could probably leave it that way in the notes. Right. What's relevant here, and it's already italicized, what they're going to say. They're not even they're not even gonna let them finish. Right? <laughs> you don't even need to listen to them here. The person hasn't even necessarily taken a position. I actually see this a fair bit in politics with regard to like I don't even need to watch the debates. I know what this person is going to say. Or I don't even listen to Becky anymore because Becky's a Republican and she couldn't possibly have anything relevant to say. Or uh, just realized I'm, I'm going to pick on names right now. Um, I don't want to listen to Karen. She's such a Karen, <laughs> you know? Um, she couldn't have anything relevant to say. Well, I mean, that's obviously false. Um, we can't anticipate what somebody's going to say or what somebody's position is going to be. And even if we rely reliably could anticipate that, you need to critique the idea as an idea, independent from the person who delivers it. So, this, uh, the example we're going to use for this is quite similar to the last one we talked about in the general ad hom section. So, you can forget what Father Hennessy will say this evening about abortion because Father Hennessy is a priest and priests are required to think that abortion is a mortal sin. So, really, we can see here that the only difference between this and the earlier example is it's anticipating what Father Hennessy will say. Um, you know, it's made the water from the well bad before you've even drawn it. Um, and it poisons the entire well, right? It taints everything this person could ever say, simply because of who they are, right? That's why it's called poisoning the well. So as you can see, this like the previous example about this is like the previous example about Father Hennessy, except in this example, Father Hennessy hasn't even said anything yet. <laughs> okay. So let's skip forward a bit to get an example. 
I wanted to give you guys a slightly different example because I feel like the Father Hennessy one gets a bit confusing if we uh, stick to it for too long. So here we have, my opponent has donated millions to oil companies. We're assuming that this is a political opponent. Uh, he has supported drilling for oil in protected locations. Now he's going to come and present his energy plan. But let me remind, remind you, he comes as a wolf in sheep's clothing. <laughs> Right, so we can see this going to um, in here to see that we, we've poisoned the well in advance. This person hasn't even had a chance to present his energy plan. Anything he could say is tainted by this claim, by who he is. So uh, let's move along. So our next sub subcategory, our next subcategory of a. Uh, ad hom is guilt by association. Again, this is obviously going to be another personal attack because it is a subcategory of ad hom, uh, and it's going to be another relevance fallacy because it's going to present us with irrelevant information. So, um, Okay, I, I appreciate that the textbook points this out. Let's take a moment with it. Uh, outside of this classroom, the phrase guilt by association refers to the concept that a person is judged by the company he or she keeps. For example, if you hang out with unsavory people, then others may think that you too have unsavory qualities. We, however, mean something different by the phrase guilt by association. We use the phrase to denote a very common version of the ad hom. The fallacy guilt by association occurs when a speaker or writer tries to persuade us to dismiss a belief by telling us that someone we don't like has that belief. Um, my favorite example of this is actually um, about Hitler. I don't know if you guys know this, but Hitler was a vegetarian. Uh, I guess maybe, maybe I should say Hitler is allegedly a vegetarian. Um, I'm not sure how reliable that claim is. Uh, anyway, Hitler was a vegetarian, and I also am a vegetarian. I have had this fact thrown in my face, as if somehow that taints all of vegetarianism, because this one guy was a vegetarian. Well, no doubt Hitler also brushed his teeth, right? Should we stop brushing our teeth, or should we assume that tooth brushing uh, is uh, an awful activity because a bad person did it? No, obviously not. Uh, this is an attempt to yeah, dis uh, dismiss a belief by associating it with someone we don't like. So really quickly, let's get ourselves an example. I like the textbook one. You think waterboarding is torture? That sounds like something these left-wing college professors would say. I don't know if you guys have heard about it, but apparently we are all just super left-wing and cannot be trusted. <laughs> so what's happening here? Um, it's pretty clear that instead of addressing whether or not waterboarding is torture, uh, the speaker is attempting to associate that claim, that idea, uh, with a left-wing agenda, as it were. So, um, the speaker wants the listener to dismiss the idea that waterboarding is torture, so he or she tries to taint that idea by associating it with left-wing college professors, people he or she thinks the listeners don't like or trust. So, um, if you're still confused, you can read this, but I'm going to move on. Uh, we have the genetic fallacy which is very similar to poisoning the well. If you see that it's very similar, uh, you're not wrong, but I will ask you to keep in mind that... Oh no. Oh no, you've seen my desktop screen. Okay. I'll have to cut that out. Okay. <laughs> Let me just reset here. Here we go. <laughs> okay. So, if you notice that uh, this is very similar to poisoning the well. You're not wrong, but I will ask you to keep in mind that all of these fallacies are 
kinds of ad homs and they're all kinds of relevance fallacies. So quite right, they are very similar. <laughs> there are very small differences between them. Okay, so this occurs when a speaker or writer uh, argues that the origin of a contention in and of itself automatically renders it false. So if the origin is just an individual, like something that individual made up, it's going to seem a lot like poisoning the well. Uh, but you'll see this actually goes back much further than that. So let's get this in our notes. Try to conserve space a little bit. Oh, I've taken off the R. Okay, so let's get an example of this and we'll talk about it a bit more. So, that idea is absurd. It's just something the Tea Party put out there. Um, I think this one's kind of a bit dated. I don't know if you guys know about the Tea Party. It was a third party that rose up uh, shortly after President Obama was elected and put in office. So, um, is kind of seen as being fringe, which I suppose by definition third parties are, uh, but again that doesn't make their ideas wrong. We still need to respond to the ideas themselves. So I prefer this as an example. Where on earth did you hear that? On talk radio. You guys know I like talk radio, specifically conservative AM talk radio. So uh, why would I listen to it? Right? Uh, in part, it's because I think somebody has to keep an eye on those people, um, and in part, it's because I, I find it entertaining, and often I find it quite informative. Uh, maybe informative of what uh, political conservatives are thinking or saying at any time, or even factually informative. I, I have heard about many things first on talk radio. You know, the mere fact that I heard from it on talk radio does not mean it's false. We can't just automatically dismiss something just because it came through the radio? That seems crazy. So that's the origin of a contention. We can uh, maybe italicize that. It's so awful. Let's underline it. Okay, so the origin in this case is talk radio. Right? And that's obviously not grounds to dismiss something. It's obviously a kind of personal attack or attack on um, some feature that the origin has. Uh, let's take a look at one more of these because I think it will really clarify what's going on in this fallacy. So this right here really makes clear the difference between this and poisoning the well. Um, God is just an idea people came up with way back before they had science. So the origin of this is just all of humanity before science. Um, it's an old idea. Those Everything those people thought uh, should be dismissed is essentially what this argument is saying. Uh, obviously that's not true. Uh, the speaker is dismissing the idea of God solely because of its origin. So here we don't just have one individual or even um, one simple thing like talk radio. We have all ideas that arose before science, whenever that was, uh, way back before they had science. This is fallacious. Don't do this. So uh, next up we have straw man. You'll notice that the straw man fallacy is a new subcategory. It's in red. Um, so let's get that in our notes. Oh, and now it's red too. Who knows what's going on there? And let's get back to the textbook. So shifting gears, uh, the straw man fallacy occurs when a speaker or writer attempts to dismiss a contention by distorting or misrepresenting it. So let's get this in our notes. So again, that's an attempt to dismiss a contention. If you're struggling with contention, you can just write claim by distorting or misrepresenting it. I see this one quite often. I 
maybe see this more than I see ad homs. I think people have actually gotten pretty good about avoiding ad homs because we recognize that uh, attacking people or the origin of a claim is not a particularly viable way to argue. I usually see these, I, I see these distortions quite often though. Okay, so what do I think about outlawing large ammunition clips? I think the idea of disarming everyone is ridiculous and dangerous. Right? Yeah, that's a, a big shift in the type of arguments we're looking at. So uh, what's happening here is we're talking about outlawing large ammunition clips. And you know what? Let's just go ahead and make this bold. It's not even outlawing like ammunition clips. It's outlawing large ammunition clips. And then what does the person actually respond to? I think the idea of disarming everyone is ridiculous and dangerous. Are those two things the same at all? No. What's happened here is the speaker has attempted to dismiss a claim by distorting or misrepresenting it. It's a straightforward misrepresentation. We were never talking about disarming everyone. We were talking about outlawing large ammunition clips. Our textbook wants us to know that it's almost as common as the ad hom fallacy. <laughs> Although again, I don't know where they're getting that information from. <laughs> so, uh, let's look at uh, something that you may have come across in your life because uh, Nevada has legalized medical marijuana. Uh, well, recreational at this point. Ah, times change very quickly. This is not an old textbook. Uh, I think we should legalize medical marijuana. The speaker says. And then somebody responds, <laughs> your friend, <laughs> responds, maybe you think everyone should go around stoned, but I think that's absurd. I usually heard quite a lot of this on talk radio <laughs> while uh, legalization was being discussed in the state of Nevada. And yes, I know I say Nevada incorrectly. You guys can stop telling me that. That's how I pronounce it. I'm not from here. Okay, so maybe you think everyone should go around stoned, but I think that's absurd. Right? That's not what you've said. You've said specifically medical marijuana, right? Um, even the people who had access to medical marijuana presumably wouldn't be going around stoned. Uh, right? So your friend has trans transformed your position into one that nobody would accept. Uh, here's another example. It would be bad for the economy to economy to tighten emission standards for sulfur dioxide. And the progressive says, how can you say that? Having more sulfur dioxide in the atmosphere is the last thing we need. Well, clearly they are not saying that they that more sulfur dioxide in the air is a good thing. They're saying it would be bad for the economy. Those are two very different claims. I quite like this example because it's a bit more subtle. This is the kind of thing I think uh, you should be looking for for that extra credit assignment. Uh, these things can be very sneaky. The conservative never said she wanted more sulfur dioxide in the atmosphere. The progressive is putting words into her mouth. He has misstated her position. So just a little review where an ad hom attempts to dismiss a claim on the basis of irrelevant considerations about the person making it, the straw man fallacy attempts to dismiss a claim by misrepresenting it. And again, these are all still relevance fallacies. So uh, next we have false dilemma. Oh, I just realized why that other one wasn't in red. It's because I copied it from here, of course. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, false dilemma. You'll notice that this is red. We have no sub subcategories of the straw man. It's just a straw man. So uh, false dilemma, actually, before we move on, uh, I have also heard this referred to as a false dichotomy. I wrote it in here, but I couldn't get the color right. Uh, anyway, so uh, I might refer to this as either a false dilemma or a false dichotomy. Uh, I, I hope that doesn't, you know, make things 
problematic uh, for you guys. I want to break this one down a little bit. So when we have this word false uh, in front of another word in our fallacies, um, it modifies the following word. Uh, that might sound kind of obscurantist or ridiculous to you, but let's talk about what uh, dilemma or dichotomy means. So we've got this die on here, and some of you know exactly what that means when we add that to a word or when that's at the beginning of a word. Uh, die means two, right? We were just talking about the example with sulfur dioxide. That di on there means two. So we have that in both dichotomy and dilemma. Uh, I prefer dichotomy because people talk about dilemmas all the time, but they don't mean just two things. Technically, it means just two things. This is like the difference, well, between the dictionary definition of decimate and the uh, common use of decimate. Uh, decimate technically means to reduce by one-tenth, I believe, um, because des, right? Um, and some people are really hung up on that. Uh, I'm not. I am a little hung up on people using this to mean more than one thing, so I just prefer to say dichotomy, uh, because typically we do use that to refer to situations in which there are only two options. So um, what exactly is false about a false dichotomy? Well, plenty of things aren't binary. Plenty of things have way more than two options available to you. So it is false that there are only two. It is false that it is a true dichotomy at all. And that's where this gets its name from. Again, I will probably continue to refer to it as a false dichotomy. Uh, I hope that's okay with y'all. So let's look at our, let's get a definition in here. The false dilemma fallacy happens when someone tries to establish a conclusion by offering it as the only alternative to something we will find unacceptable, unattainable, or implausible. So let's put this in here. Oh no, that is just, it's like it's getting worse. Okay, probably good that we're on to a new page. So you'll note the only alternative. So again, we've got this, this concept of you have two options. Uh, this absolutely unacceptable, unattainable, or implausible thing, or this thing that now looks reasonable by comparison. Let's get ourselves an example of this. I think that's going to be on the next page. Yes, it is. Okay. So, we must either eliminate Social Security or the country will go bankrupt. Therefore, we must eliminate Social Security. You know what? Let's not use this example. Um, we can talk about it, though. So, uh, this is a fallacy. <laughs> Big surprise, you guys. Uh, the speaker doesn't present all the options, right? We must either eliminate Social Security or the country will go bankrupt. So obviously the country going bankrupt is meant to be the unacceptable, unattainable, or implausible option. Um, and eliminating Social Security is meant to be the only alternative to that. Uh, therefore, we must eliminate Social Security. Right? The speaker here ignores for example, the alternative of cutting something other than Social Security, or raising the age of elig eligibility, or having better off earners pay more into the system, right? Rain raising taxes on those with higher income. Um, these are all, regardless of how you feel about these options personally, we do need to recognize that these are options uh, that are alternatives to going bankrupt or eliminating Social Security. So, it is false that there are only two options. So let's look at this next example. I believe this is what we'll put in our notes. Um, either we allow the oil companies to drill for oil in the Gulf, or we will be at the mercy of OPEC. Therefore, we shouldn't prevent the oil companies from drilling for oil in the Gulf. Uh, I'm putting this in our notes because I hope it helps you guys with the exam. 
wink, wink. There's some innuendo. Um, okay. So let's uh, let's talk about what's going on here. This is a false dilemma, false dichotomy. Right? The speaker thinks oil companies should be free to drill in the Gulf and tries to support his position by pretending that it's either that or be at the mercy of OPEC. An alternative he assumes we will find unacceptable. The speaker ignores other options. This is the, the magic of the false dichotomy. Right? Uh, saving fuel is one alternative option. Getting oil from shale is another. Going solar is possibly a third. Maybe you can think of others. Uh, I want to make a note here. Just because you might not have a whole cornucopia of alternate options to present somebody who presents you with a false dichotomy um, doesn't mean that there aren't other options. The limits of our imaginations or the limits of our knowledge on a specific subject are not that that is not evidence that uh, those other options don't exist. It just means that maybe you're not particularly informed on this subject, or maybe you're not that imaginative, or maybe creative problem solving just isn't something you enjoy engaging in. We cannot reasonably conclude from our own inability to think of alternate options uh, that alternate options do not exist. I think quite often we get ourself into, ourselves into these kinds of uh, false dichotomies because we can't imagine alternate options. And I want you guys to carefully look at some of your own beliefs for these. I, I find them in my own quite often, and I have to remind myself that, yes, this, this textbook's great, right? It's giving us all these alternate options, and it's suggesting that maybe even you can think of others. And I want to suggest that that's great, thank you textbook, um, but maybe you don't have the resources to draw on that this textbook does. Uh, maybe you, your cell phone's dead and you can't even Google the thing, right? Uh, that doesn't mean other options do not exist. We should always entertain the possibility that there only appear to be two options, uh, simply because we lack information, right? At one point, solar was not an option, and now it is. Uh, so new options can be developed. Uh, the limits of our imagination are not the limits of reality. That's what I want you guys to know. Okay, one more example. Look, either we can clean out the garage, or this junk will run us out of house and home. <laughs> This is a pretty easy one, right? The man is pretending the only alternative to cleaning out the garage is being run out of house and home, an unacceptable alternative. He's ignored other options, such as not acquiring more junk, right? Maybe organize a little bit. This this reminds me of that Netflix show with it, things sparking joy, right? Um, maybe you just need to get better at organizing. <laughs> maybe you don't need to throw half of your stuff away or stop acquiring more stuff. Okay, uh, I think we're ready to move on. So we've got some subcategories of the false dichotomy. Um, the first one is the perfectionist fallacy. Um, I believe it's the only one, actually. So um, Let's talk about the perfectionist fallacy. So... Um, Two false dilemma arguments are so... Oh, nope, there are two in here. I only review one. Um, is that they... So common they have their own names. One is called the perfectionist fallacy. Uh, this fallacy is committed when a speaker or writer ignores options between perfection and nothing. I, I do find that this one is quite common. Um, but I want to say a little bit about it before we move on. Oh, the mystery of my Word document software. Okay, so uh, it's pretty easy to see a perfectionist fallacy because it really just gives us these two options. What I really want to say about the perfectionist fallacy is that quite often a middle ground simply won't do. Um, and in those cases, 
there is no middle ground between perfection and nothing, right? Um, it is not, in fact, a false dichotomy. It is an actual dichotomy. You really do have a binary choice to make. So, um, yeah, the, the, that it, just because... Well, actually, your homework is a good example, right? Uh, either you turn it in or you don't. <laughs> Um, there's really no middle ground there. <laughs> so if you wanted to, it's not fallacious simply because there really are only two options between 100% and zero. These do occur in our lives. Um, you wouldn't say to a math instructor uh, where you got an answer kind of correct. <laughs> like, well, I got it kind of right. You know, uh, no, there's no such thing as kind of right. You you got it wrong. <laughs> Either you get the solution that they were looking for or nothing. Um, this is probably more common on multiple choice exams, right? Uh, if two answers are very similar, maybe they're just one number different. One of those answers is right and one of those answers is incorrect. So uh, I don't want you guys to confuse this. Uh, the false dichotomy and specifically the perfectionist fallacy for situations where the choice is actually binary. Okay, let's get ourselves an example. So, drilling for oil in the Gulf won't give us independence from OPEC, therefore we shouldn't drill. Right? Um, maybe independence, uh, maybe it won't give us perfect independence, but it will uh, certainly make us less reliant right? Um, again, unlike the speaker in the previous oil drilling example, example, the speaker tries to establish that we should not drill in the Gulf. She gives us a perfectionist fallacy because she, because she ignores the less than perfect possibility that drilling for oil in the Gulf could make us less dependent on OPEC. The example I want to put in our notebooks is this one because uh, my roommate is an English professor and he says he hears this all the time. I'm going to help him out a little bit. Okay. A single English course won't make anyone a great writer, so I don't see why we have to take one. What's happening there? Um, no, of course a single English course won't make anyone a great writer. That's obviously false. What will a single English course do, though? It will make you a better writer. Right? Um... The speaker's restricted our options. He's arguing that unless a single course can make us great writers, perfection, we shouldn't have to take one at all. He ignores the possibility that a single English course might make us better writers. Right? Um, your English professors are not trying to make you the next Hemingway. Or maybe Hemingway is a bad example because I don't think he was very good. Um, <laughs> but it, they, they're, they're not trying to make you great writers. Uh, that, that's, that's going to take a lot more than a single English course. We just want to help make you better writers. And a single English course, if taken seriously, will absolutely do that. Um, as mentioned, we're not really going to talk about the line drawing fallacy. There's no need to put it in your notes. Um, so, briefly, this fallacy occurs when a speaker or writer assumes that either a crystal clear line can be drawn between two things, or else there is no difference between them. So um, this one's quite common, but uh, I feel like we talked about it a bit when we talked about vague language. Um, it doesn't make sense to say that someone is rich. After all, nobody can say just how much money a person has to be in order to be rich. No, well, no. <laughs> um, just because there's not a specific thing you can point to because you can't draw a clear line doesn't mean that the thing never happens. Um, again, you can't say exactly when a video game is too violent, therefore no video game is too violent. I believe the textbook actually has an example of this being used uh, in a Supreme Court decision. So let's look at this. Uh, Antonin Scalia was a justice on the United States Supreme Court until his death in early 2016. Attorney Theodore B. Olson represented those who sought to have the Supreme Court rule that California's Proposition 8 which banned gay marriage, was unconstitutional. The following is from the oral arguments made before the U.S. Supreme Court on Proposition 8. 
So I want to say I have an immense respect for our Supreme Court judges. I do not think these are typically foolhardy people, uh, but this is a really good example uh, of a false dichotomy, uh, specifically the line drawing fallacy. Uh, so Justice Scalia said, when did it become constitutional? It being uh, same-sex marriage. Olson, who was arguing for it, said, When we as a culture determined that sexual orientation is a characteristic that individuals cannot control. Scalia respond, <laughs> responded, I see. When did that happen? When did that happen? This right here is our line drawing fallacy. Olson said, there's no specific date in time. Right? Like, we weren't doing polls uh, with regard to when the culture deemed this the case. Uh, and Scalia responded, how am I supposed to know how to decide the case then? So here he has assumed that because we can't point to a specific moment when this thing that obviously has become the case, I think the vast majority of our culture agrees that sexual orientation is not a characteristic that individuals can control, um, regardless of how you feel about same-sex marriage. Um, this is pretty uh, uncontentious. Uh, but here we have him saying he can't decide the case unless you can point to a specific moment when this became true. That's obviously very, very erroneous and fallacious reasoning. I have a whole rant about this uh, that I just don't want in the pre-recorded lecture. I feel like it would take too much time, uh, but I do want to bring your attention to the fact that uh, some of you, especially if you're closer to my age, uh, may think of another time when this fallacy was in our courts. Uh, it was used in our courts. Uh, you're welcome to use that on your extra credit uh, if you're thinking of what I'm thinking of. Uh, it, it's a really great example. And uh, if you're curious, you can always message me or remind me to talk about it at some other point. So I don't want to use any more of our lecture time on that, though. Okay, moving on. Misplacing the burden of proof. We can see that this is a different kind of relevance fallacy. It is red. What is this? Okay. So this one is a, a little difficult to determine, and we're going to draw on some things we've learned in previous lectures uh, to figure out what's going on here, but I, I like this example. If your doctor says you're infected with the West Nile virus, you will say, doctor, what makes you think that? If she says, what makes you think you aren't? You'll get a new doctor. <laughs> her remark is absurd because it's her job to tell you why she thinks you are infected with the West Nile. It's not your job to tell her why you think you aren't. Um, uh, as in this case, sometimes the burden of proof clearly falls more heavily on one side than the other. When people try to support or prove their position by misplacing the burden of proof, they commis commit the fallacy of misplacing the burden of proof. So I don't really like this example or this uh, definition. I'm going to go retrieve a different one for our notes. So I just went and got this from the uh, recap section of the chapter. Uh, attempting to place the burden of proof on the wrong side of an issue. Uh, this Again, this one's difficult. So what this draws on from our earlier lectures uh, is from our section on credibility, right? Uh, we said extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. This is a way of... Uh, kind of saying who has the burden of proof as well, right? Uh, I think I mentioned at the time that we would talk more about this later. So it, it can be difficult to determine where the burden of proof lies, uh, but the more extraordinary a claim is, the more likely it is that the burden of proof lies with the one making the claim, um, the more unconventional a claim is. 
let's look back at the textbook. So here we have, I believe our former president's birth certificate was a forgery. Can you prove it isn't? I got a little distracted because I was thinking about when somebody did this. Not this specifically, <laughs> um, but did this recently in politics. Um, so it is clearly not someone's job to prove that something isn't a forgery. Not only is that difficult to say uh, what exactly it would involve, uh, but it is not typically the case that birth certificates are forgeries. So this example is quite tricky. Uh, the burden of proof is on the speaker to give us a reason for thinking the birth certificate was forged, and he or she has tried to transfer the burden to the listener. Why is the burden of proof on the speaker? Because forging a birth certificate is the exception rather than the rule. If everyone normally forged his or her birth certificate, then it would be common to want proof that one wasn't forged. But in the real world, forging a birth certificate is rare, so the person who makes the accusation has the burden of proof. I quite like this. Um, it's a good thing just to keep in mind generally. Uh, this, much like uh, credibility judgments, uh, is a little more nuanced than a lot of the things we talk about in this class. Um, let's move on. So, guns shouldn't be outlawed. I'll bet you can't think of a single good, can, should be outlawed, I'm sorry. Uh, I bet you can't think of a single good reason they shouldn't. And again, this kind of speaks to our uh, perfectionist fallacy or our false dilemma. Um, it's not my job. The limits of my imagination uh, are not the limits of reality. <laughs> so the speaker has incorrectly shifted the burden of proof to the listeners. In the United States, the Constitution is interpreted as giving the people the right to own a gun, so the burden of proof is on the speaker to explain why the right should be removed. Right? Um, I kind of see this one a fair bit, too. Okay, I believe there's a bit of a recap on this one that I want to look at. Okay, so in determining burden of proof, which side has the burden of proof often depends on context. But speaking generally, if the issue is a factual one, the side making the more outlandish, the claim having the lowest initial credibility, has the burden of proof. Also, other thing, all other things being equal, the burden of proof falls on the person who wants to change something rather than on the person who wants to leave things alone. This is just a general rule. Um, and I like this example. In criminal, of court, in criminal court, court, the burden of proof always falls on the prosecution. The defense is not required to prove innocence. It must only try to keep the prosecution from succeeding in its attempt to prove guilt. This is why um, people are quite often proven not guilty rather than innocent. Anyway, uh, innocence is very difficult to prove, uh, if not impossible in many instances. Uh, this is what it is meant by the phrase innocent until proved guilty, right? the presumption of innocence. Um, and back to our discussion of... Um, imagination and the limits of imagination. This also comes up right here. So uh, this is sometimes called an appeal to ignorance. I'm happy to just call it misplacing the burden of proof. Uh, nobody has proved ghosts don't exist, therefore they do. And this is a really tidy example. We could put it in here if we wanted to. Um, I think this is featured in some of our discussions. So this is a fallacy because proof requires more than the absence of disproof. Right? Um, right when so someone asserts that we should be believe a claim because nobody has proved it false, um, that's called an appeal to ignorance, but I would say it's almost an appeal to the limits of imagination or the limits of current science or any of these things. Right? Um, 
I like their recommendation too. Here's our recommendation. Be suspicious when somebody regards your inability to disprove his or her position as evidence for it. Right. Take note of where the burden of proof falls in such situations. Your speaker may be trying to erroneously place that burden on you. Super valuable, like just in life in general. <laughs> okay, let's move on. The moment has arrived, you guys. Uh, here is begging the question, which they have put in parentheses, assuming what you are trying to prove. We are not going to call it that. That would be a pain to write out. I'm not putting that on your exams. <laughs> I'm not going to call it that, but I am going to give you the alternative name for this. Okay, there we go. Um, I give an alternate name because uh, a lot of people are just really uncomfortable with using this common English phrase in this way. So if you're one of those, uh, I completely understand. So this is when a conclusion is taken for granted in the premises. Uh, but let's look back at the textbook. So they note that in everyday language to beg the question has lately come to mean simply to raise the question. Traditionally, and in logic, begging the question means something else entirely. A speaker or writer is guilty of begging the question logically when he or she tries to support a contention by offering as evidence what amounts to as a repackaging of the very contention in question. Whew, that's a mouthful. So <laughs> this is when an argument... You can put all this in our notes as well, or you can use the definition I gave you. Um, so, that really is... Oh no, it took the page number with it. Okay. So we can see that these actually say the same thing, right? When an argument tries to support, and they've got it in some abused quotes, um, maybe it should be italicized, um, a contention, a claim, right? We could even fix this a little bit or make it a bit more human readable. Claim by offering as evidence what amounts to as a repackaging of the very claim in question. or issue in question, right? Um, so another way to think of that is when a conclusion is taken for granted in the premises. Let's get some examples, and this will be a bit more clear. So, obviously the governor told the truth about the budget. He wouldn't lie to us about it. In essence, the reason given here for believing the governor is that he wouldn't lie. This is exactly the same thing. <laughs> But it's so close that it cannot really be counted as evidence. If we are sure the governor told the truth, we can't be sure. If we aren't sure the governor told the truth, we can't be sure he wouldn't lie. Right? Um, it's a little confusing, but I think pretty straightforward. So um, for our notes, uh, I'm going to have us use the classic example. Uh, if it upsets anybody's sensibilities, you can put something else in your notes. Um, that God exist is, exists is proved by Scripture because Scripture is the word of God and thus cannot be false. Hopefully you guys can see exactly what's going on here, right? Um, you have to assume the conclusion in order to accept the premise, right? Okay. So, if someone disputes that God exists, then he or she must also dispute that anything is the word of God. Um, so, of course, you're not going to agree that God's existence is proved by Scripture, because you're also not going to accept that Scripture is the word of God. <laughs> um, so, it assumes in its premise, the evidence it offers, um, the very thing it's trying to prove. So here's uh, an alternate example. 
women should not be allowed in combat because it's prohibited by the Defense Department. Right? This is, uh, I've spoken with some of you um, when we were talking about um, rhetorical definitions uh, about the, begging the question. This is exactly uh, what I was referencing. Right? Uh, rather than making an argument, we're just kind of trying to define something into existence um, or into truth. So this is merely saying that something shouldn't be allowed because it isn't. <laughs> it does not explain why it shouldn't. And what we're interested here is why. Um, if the thing at issue is whether or not women should be allowed in combat, which it clearly is, um, saying because it isn't or because the definition is this, um, really doesn't get at the thing we're trying to talk about, which is the why of it. Um, this essential link between rhetorical definitions and question begging is uh, subtle, but if you can see it, um, it's really valuable. We also talked about this a little when we talked about loaded questions. Um, they often beg the question. So let's look at an example of that. Bill says, do Republicans hate women because they're angry white males? Yes or no? <laughs> Jill naturally says, ah. Bill is like, well, answer it, right? We can see that this is a loaded question. Uh, but it also begs the question. Bill hasn't given a legitimate argument for his belief that Republicans hate women. He has simply asked a question which assumes that very point. He is just smuggling his belief into his question, which amounts to trying to establish something simply by assuming it. Excellent. So we're going to talk about appeals to emotion last, um, and then we'll talk a little about extra credit. Um, but I want to say we're not going to go over all the appeals to emotion. There are not an infinite number. <laughs> but quite a few appeals to emotion. And uh, I, th I think we can recognize uh, emotions without listing them all out, so we're just going to talk about this broadly. So, this occurs when a speaker or writer supports a contention by playing on our emotions rather than producing a real argument. So. We can just say, this way we're keeping the speaker or writer uh, out of the uh, out of the notes because that can be really cumbersome to uh, to put in our notes. Okay. So and again, they're using these scare quotes. I don't particularly like it, but I understand why they're distinguishing. Okay. Um, when an argument supports a contention by playing on our emotions rather than producing producing a maybe we should put this in here too a real argument. <laughs> it, um, let's get an example of this. So we've got this argument from outrage. It works pretty well. Um, I quite like it. Uh, they're all going to follow this for format: argument from outrage, argument from pity argument from flattery, which is sometimes called apple polishing. Um, and again, there are a lot of these. So we can just broadly talk about appeals to emotions rather than inserting the specific emotion involved. Um, if you're curious about them, they do go over quite a few of them. Uh, do you think Apple doesn't know it hires 12-year-old children to make its electronics? You think it isn't aware it pays them slave wages and has them work in buildings without heat or air conditioning? It knows. <laughs> Apple products can't be any good. So, this is a lengthy one, but we're copying and pasting, hopefully, so we can just carry on this way. Uh, this is the conclusion, right? Uh, it's a claim about the quality of Apple products. So when we think about this objectively, um, 
112 year old children having very, very poor pay and terrible working conditions does nothing to prove uh, that Apple products aren't any good. These things could all be true. And they still wouldn't, Apple's knowledge of these things could be completely obvious, right? That could definitely be the case. All of these things could be the case, and it still would do nothing to prove that Apple products aren't any good. I mean, it might lower the chances, right? I don't think 12-year-olds are maybe the best suited to produce Apple products, and people who are being paid well uh, with good working conditions do tend to uh, value their work more and therefore produce better products. Um, but that's a different argument. You'll see, I've made an inductive argument there. Um, from which we can reasonably conclude that Apple products maybe aren't as good as they would be if these things were changed. Right? But here, what's happening, uh, this is just trying to make you feel outraged. The speaker is outraged. They're indignant. They're upset about it. It could be an appeal to pity as well. Um, a lot of these emotional appeals don't always work the way we intend them to. Like, this just really makes me feel bad for the 12-year-olds. I guess it makes me outraged at Apple. Um, but these emotional appeals, I think, are best understood broadly. Uh, we can see really clearly, though, that there's no relationship between uh, what is masquerading as premises, or what are masquerading as premises, uh, they, between that and the conclusion. This is really the essence of why these are all called relevance fallacies. Uh, I look at this, and this might sound callous, but I say, so what? I'm not saying so what to, you know, slave wages or heat and air conditioning. I'm saying so what to the quality of the products. Um, I'm simply recognizing that these things are not related. This is irrelevant to this. But maybe we will look at one more, um, right? This passage doesn't support the contention that Apple products aren't any good. Rather, it tries to induce us to have that belief by making us angry, or in my case, kind of sad. Um, scare tactics are another type of emotional appeal. Um, you really should get a prudential life insurance policy. What would happen to your spouse and children if you die? Remember, you are their main source of income. Would they be forced to move? <laughs> so this argument tries to scare you into buying prudential life, a prudential life insurance policy. But even if it's true that your spouse and children will be forced to move if you die, that is no reason to favor insurance from this particular company. Right? Threats, too, if they substitute for an argument, are regarded as scare tactics. Gavin Newsom, it's the uh, governor of California, uh, would make a terrible governor. Do you seriously think I could be interested in, sorry, uh, interested in being your girlfriend if you vote for him? <laughs> Here the speaker is just kind of threatening the, the person uh, who's listening, uh, their potential partner, with not dating them if they vote for Gavin Newsom. We can see clearly no reason um, is really given, uh, right? The speaker hasn't said a thing to support the idea that Gavin Newsom would make a terrible governor. She is just threatening the other person. Obviously, if a spe speaker issues a credible threat, it would not be a fallacy to protect yourself. Um, if you vote for Va Gavin Newsom, I'll shoot your dog, would be a compelling reason for not voting, <laughs> would be a compelling compelling reason for not voting for Newsom if the speaker actually would carry out the threat. But no threat to you is related to whether Gavin Newsom would make a terrible governor, right? So I think that's an important nuanced point. Um, it's a very good reason, right? Uh, threats can offer <laughs> reasons to do things, obviously. Um, but they can't make claims like this, Gavin Newsom would make a terrible governor. They can't make them true. So, um, I think there's another section in here. Um, appeal to pity, right? Uh, Jane is be the best qualified candidate. After all, she is out of work and desperately needs a job. Unfortunately, here the speaker is not given a reason 
uh, for thinking that Jane is the best qualified candidate. He or she is just tugging at our heartstrings. So it's not surprising that these emotional appeals are um, persuasive, right? Uh, but they shouldn't be, uh, because the claim that's being made is totally unrelated. I got cut off a little there because apparently my hard drive is full of videos I have made for you guys. Um, fortunately, I got cut off at a good point and I have deleted a bunch of stuff, so we should have a little bit of time here. Um, and I hopefully will be able to just put this video together with the previous section. That was indeed uh, everything I wanted to say about uh, relevance fallacies. We are done. So just a quick like, recap here. Um, these fallacies are a mistake in reasoning, and all the fallacies we talked about today were relevance fallacies. So if you're, you know, what is that mistake that's being made in all these fallacies? Uh, well, for whatever reason, uh, the argument the premises do not actually support the conclusion, but more specifically, they don't support the conclusion because they're irrelevant to it in one way or another. Ad homs are irrelevant because the quality of the person making a claim is not the quality of the claim. Uh, straw men are irrelevant because it's, well, simply some other claim um, that's being used to draw the conclusion. Oh, uh, false dichotomies are irrelevant because there are, in fact, other choices. And the real claim that's being made here is that there are only two choices. So misplacing the burden of proof um, is irrelevant because, well, you shouldn't have to prove the thing somebody else is trying to prove. Um, question begging. Uh, is relevant, I suppose, uh, in that it has to do with the things we're talking about, uh, but it fails to offer relevant support for the claim because it's just a reiteration or repackaging of the claim. And appeals to emotion are irrelevant because, as we can see, the, uh, the information that we're given is just meant to make us feel ways about things. It's not actually the sort of information we'd be looking for to support a claim like this. Okay, so that brings me to our next section, which I have pre-typed, apparently way down here for you. Oh, shoot, spoiler alert, you guys. Um, I don't know if you know this, but I'm going to talk about Santa Claus. <laughs> um, and I mean this spoiler alert mostly playfully, but if you listen to these with your kids around, you might want to pause this and save the extra credit example for another time, uh, because I am going to talk about the reality of Santa Claus. So <laughs> I don't know, maybe that was just me being silly. Um, let's get this all on one page, which is how it ended up down so low in the first place. Okay, so what I've done here, now that I get rid of my spoiler alert, um, is I have typed up an example of what I'm looking for for extra credit number two. No, not number at. Uh, extra credit number two, which of course you can get two points added to your final grade for. Um, please don't send me these just yet. It's okay if you did. Um, I mentioned them during review and whatnot, but that was meant to be like a bit of a teaser. Um, what I'm looking for here is just a paragraph, I or some paragraphs. Um, I would love if you would italicize or underline or whatever um, the things we've talked about in class. Uh, that you wish to point to. Uh, but this extra credit assignment is, in essence, very much like the first extra credit assignment. You can find anything we discuss formally in class. Um, and I'm saying formal, not 
former, uh, formally. So it can't be something that we casually chat about. <laughs> uh, anything in the textbook, uh, anything that goes in our notes. Um, I want you to find three examples. So this whole thing here would serve as one example. Uh, three examples of beliefs you have had, arguments you have made, positions you have held uh, that you have since changed or given up because you realized that your reasons, your premises, whatever, um, were false or fallacious or erroneous or that you were being affected by a cognitive bias, right? Um, so let's talk about this as we read through this. Um, this is also all not true. I actually was not raised with a belief in Santa Claus. So, um, but you can pick anything from your entire life. So if you want to pick something from your early childhood to analyze and discuss why you gave up that belief and why your reasons for accepting it in the first place were false, uh, that is totally okay. But uh, as I've mentioned before, um, nobody is a perfect thinker. We're not all perfectly critical. Uh, I probably, well, I may have believed in Santa if I had been raised with the Santa myth. Um, this is really annoying me. Why can't Santa be possessive of things? Have I spelled it incorrectly? Um, anyway, so let's look at this. When I was a child of about five or six, I fervently believed Santa Claus was real. I believed he was real mostly because my peers thought he was real. I also, I was also influenced by the fact that my parents affirmed the myth. So I have identified two things here. You can just identify one if you want, um, or three or five. Uh, I've identified the reasons I had for holding the belief. I need you to do this. You have to identify why you held the belief in the first place, why you thought that thing. Uh, and then I've elaborated a little bit. Um, my parents told me about his factory at the North Pole, all his elves and flying reindeer. Um, and I was likely influenced by, okay, but there we go. That's just an elaboration of what it means for my parents to affirm the myth. You don't have to be that elaborate. I just like writing silly stories. Okay, <clears throat> next step. I was influenced by my peers because of bandwagon effect, which is a cognitive bias. So in this sentence, I have identified uh, the re one of the reasons I had for believing my peers, for this earlier belief, or for this or early accepting uh, this reason for having the belief, right? Um, I do want you to identify it by name, um, and I'd like you to say a little more about uh, why you accepted this irrational reason. This is to say, I unconsciously aligned my thinking with the thinking of those around me. Here I discuss a fallacy that we haven't got talked about yet, um, but again, all the more reason to wait until the near the end of the semester to send me uh, your submissions. We have also discussed the bandwagon fallacy. The fallacy is different from the cognitive bias because it involves a fallacious argument in which the speaker erroneously argues that because everyone thinks something, it must be true. I've gone on to say, I'm not sure if anyone ever argued for Santa's existence, but I can remember thinking that so many people couldn't possibly be wrong. So in this paragraph, I predominantly, um, maybe this should be its own paragraph. There you go. Um, in this paragraph right here, I predominantly discuss uh, the bandwagon effect and bandwagon policy, policy uh, and why these are erroneous and how they erroneously influenced my thinking, or rather how they made my thinking erroneous. I need you to unpack it for me like this. Um, this is not an easy submission. It's two points added to your final grade. That is not insignificant. Um, so I'm going to expect some significant work from you guys. My uncritical acceptance of my parents' claim is best understood as a mistaken appeal to authority. So in this paragraph, I'm going to address my second reason for believing the Santa Claus myth. Um, and again, I have identified the item that we talked about in class. I have italicized and underlined it. 
you can do whatever. You can highlight it in blue. I don't know. Um, whatever makes you happy. My parents absolutely knew, knew more about the world than I did, right? That is true. However, I knew that they had never been to the North Pole, and I knew they had never seen an elf or flying reindeer. If I had simply thought this through at the time, I would have likely realized that my parents simply lacked the capacity to make something true merely by asserting it. Right? This is a mistaken appeal to authority, which again, we haven't really talked about in class. Um, I say it again in a different way. This is always a good strategy for writing, you guys. Uh, this is to say, while my parents' authority was very real, right? Uh, we talked about this today with the false dichotomy. Um, it's not that the authority is false. Um, it's that authority in this specific region is false. Why am I explaining fallacies that we'll have entire lessons on to you guys? Um, <laughs> anyway, this is just to say, while my parents' authority was real, it was erroneous to think that their authority extended to matters of existence, right? Um, even though they are authorities, right? They have special information compared to a child. Um, they, they, they don't know everything that exists and doesn't exist. Um, them saying something that exists, they, they don't have the power or the authority to make that true just by saying it. Um, and then I've concluded rather simply, I no longer believe in Santa Claus because all the reasons I had for accepting his existence were fallacious or otherwise irrational. Right? We've got two fallacies and a uh, cognitive bias in here. This is what I'm looking for from you guys. Brief, concise, to the point. It doesn't have to be this long. Um, obviously, it's easier for me because I can draw on all these additional resources. But hopefully, you will also be able to draw on all these resources as the class goes on. Uh, I haven't used anything here that we won't talk about in class. And you'll have tons of these. So in order to get the two points extra credit, you have to do this not once, not twice, but three times. This does not count as three. This is one belief. Um, so I would love if you guys pick um, something more relevant than Santa Claus. This is not meant to be a throwaway assignment. Um, I would love if you dig deep, but uh, we are a really very varied uh, student body. And I understand that I have some 18-year-olds, I think I probably have some 17-year-olds in my class who are part of ACSN. Um, and I have some people who are much older than myself in my class. And you guys are going to have changed your beliefs somewhat in accordance with how long you've been on the face of this earth, right? A lot of this is just a matter of experience. So if you don't have that same experience to draw on, I completely understand. Uh, or maybe you just don't want to share personal or potentially embarrassing things with me. I don't think this is potentially embarrassing. I don't think there's anything embarrassing about giving up a false belief or realizing that your reasoning had been flawed in the past and then changing uh, your beliefs based on that once you uncover that truth. That's great. That's called personal growth, <laughs> right? Or, or just growth broadly, intellectual growth. Hopefully we all grow as we go through life. So this could be something as simple as, um, you know, you thought that some movie was the best movie on earth, and since then you have learned that uh, the best is a bit subjective, and that's actually quite hard to argue for, right? That's kind of a bad example because I can't think of any reasons to that we'll talk about in this class to give up a belief like that so much. Um, you're going to have a hard time writing a significant amount about it. But um, I would love if these were more relevant things. Um, you know, we hold our beliefs pretty dear, and we should because we've worked hard to come to them. We have reasoned our way to these conclusions. So it can be somewhat uh, emotionally violent or traumatic to give up a belief. Uh, but I want you guys to understand these things as a learning process, as a growth process, rather than as something you should be ashamed of or want to hide. So hopefully this helps. If you have any additional questions, let me know. 
Um, this assignment will be open until the final exam becomes open, uh, or that is to say, until finals week. Uh, CSN has semester schedules uh, readily available on the internet, um, but you have until final week's week to submit both this extra credit assignment and the first extra credit assignment, which if you missed, I discuss in our most recent video, uh, so last week's video. Uh, yeah, take your time with this. Uh, I recommend doing it in a Word document like I have done here, um, or in this case a LibreOffice document. Uh, that way you can maybe write one and save it and come back to it as we develop more things. Uh, you can just write a list of beliefs you've held or things you thought were true that you have since uh, reasoned your way out of. Um, but I don't want it to be a case of merely getting new or more information, right? Um, when I wrote this thing about Santa Claus, I didn't say, and then somebody told me it was a lie and I just accepted it, <laughs> you know? Um, I want it to be a, an account of your way, of you reasoning your way to a better conclusion or giving up a belief because you realized that your reasons, your premises, were either fallacious or irrational, or the arguments you had accepted in the past were either fallacious or irrational. Um, so, yeah, thank you guys so much. I hope you're excited about this assignment. I'm really excited about this assignment, and I will post some links in the uh, little about video section to the thing that inspired me to make this extra credit assignment, and I would love to hear your thoughts on it. If you just hate this, I want to hear it. Uh, I'm considering making it a regular thing. Okay, thank you guys so much, and I will see you next week.